Welcome to Behind the Smoke Podcast, Barbecue War Stories. My name is Sean Walchef with Cali Comfort Barbecue. We are recording above the butcher shop with my man Derek Marceau from Valley Farm Market, and today's a very special day. Yeah, we got. Uh, I'm actually heading out to LA right after this, but we're happy that we got uh, this guy on today. He's um, someone that in Southern California most people will know about because we uh, we like to fish. And um, if you like to fish and you're in Southern California for actually anywhere nowadays, you know of a website called Bloody Decks. Bloody Decks uh, is, you know, ran by the president um, and our guest today, Ali Husseini. Um, welcome. Thank you for coming out. And uh, also uh, with Fish Dope and Local Knowledge TV. Um, you know, once I got to uh, kind of watch your show after, you know, we talked a little bit um, for you viewers that don't know, I just bought a new boat and it's actually his old boat. Um, and watching what you guys are doing for the fishing industry is pretty, pretty fucking rad, man. Um, you know, you get so many of these TV shows that, uh, are over commercialized or they're, they're not true to who they are. And to watch you and rush out there, just kind of bullshit and throwing, spitting some knowledge, um, just kind of doing what most of us fishermen think we do is uh, pretty cool. So kudos, kudos for that, man. And uh, welcome. Thanks very much. Thanks for having me, guys. I'm really looking forward to it. Absolutely. So just for our for our listeners, let us know a little bit about, let's start with local knowledge. Um, you guys are on Discovery Channel, CBS Sports. Yep. Season three you just wrapped up. Correct. Yeah. Season three actually is rerunning uh, on CBS right now. Okay. So we'll do, we launch everything new in April on Discovery. And then we rerun the whole season in Q1 on uh, on CBS Sports just to kind of broaden our audience. And it's always available online. That's another thing that we've done different from the old TV model. You know, the old TV model was you want to drive guys to TV so that your sponsors get seen and all that. Dude, sure. we're, we're internet guys. That's not the model. The model is get your shit seen. Right. Yep. Don't care if you watch a promo that lasts a minute. We don't care if you watch a full episode. We don't care if you watch 20 full episodes. We just want you to see our content, you know, and that hopefully stems from seeing a still picture that was cool that we shot or wherever, whenever, however, you know, we've got apps for every possible device you can watch a show on, <laughs> which the other guys would never do. Sure. And in fact, like, that's why we aren't on Outdoor Channel. Outdoor right. Channel will not let us put our own content really? out. Yeah. To distribute. Good for you. And that's you just, a stand, huh? man, that's the old model of doing stuff. I love Outdoor Channel and they've yeah. got a great audience and all that. But like for somebody to tell me that I can't put my shows out on the internet for like, you know, a year after they run on TV, that that just doesn't work today. Right. You know? No, I mean, I think it was pretty, pretty obvious. We know what you're doing when I went and just looked up local knowledge right there. It was like episodes yep. and view. Yep. And that, that's literally, you didn't have to subscribe to anything. You didn't have to do anything. Nope. You literally just went to your website, clicked it. And right then I was watching. And that's, that's exactly what we're after, man. And we, you know, we promote it on BD. We send out huge email blasts. We do the social media stuff on BD and local knowledge, social media. I mean, it's just everywhere, anywhere we can do it. We try to feed our partners. Uh, like with every episode we put out, we've got this great list of sponsors. I mean, honestly, an amazing list. I never thought we'd have the guys impressive. that we have now. Very impressive. And we just spoon feed them. We send them an email every week that's got the title of the episode, the summary of the episode, what hashtags to use. Um, here's links back. And then we send them a whole catalog of imagery. So we give them these badass photos that we take underwater stuff and just, you know, awesome lifestyle stuff from all over the world. And we basically spoon feed it to them. It's it, real, it totally it's is. Their, it's their products in real action, sexy, but yep. it's, it's perfect for their marketing team. Yep. Yep. And I mean, you should see my sales meetings. I'm either really good at this or really bad, but I go straight <laughs> in there. I'm like, dude, you want us to put on that NASCAR Jersey negative. That right. is not going to happen. No, you want no me to chance. do the fucking Ricky Bobby routine and yeah. not going to happen. Like right. we want to do cool shit in cool places and just kind of do stuff the way that we would normally do it. And you know, and everybody's like, Oh, well it's just like I'm being in the boat with my buddies. Well, that's what we're doing. Yeah. Sure. The whole crew, all of us were super tight. We have a great time. The minute it's not fun, I'm out. Like right. I, you know, dollar for effort and not my highest paying job sure. for sure. And it's like, you know, but I'm super, super fortunate. I ne that's never lost on me getting to do what I want to do and having these great brands believe in us and letting us go, you know, do, do stuff that we never dreamed of doing. I mean, dude, it's the best gig ever. Right. So circling back to bloody decks, that was what started all this, right? Yeah. So you got into that. Um, you're an East County guy out here where we live. Um, how did how did it all come to fruition? I mean, I, I know most of us out here in East County, we, we like to fish and hunt and, yeah. you know, we're probably some of the few San Diegans that actually do that. Um, how did you really get into it? Honestly, there, so 
I'm a fishing geek. And right. my background and my partner, Jason, we we're both video game nerds. Mm -hmm. um, I worked in the video game industry for years. He was a big video game player, like online gaming when that first came out. And this is like uh, before esports, but yeah, exactly. What way, yeah. way, way? No, we were the original nerds, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> original, uh, the OGs, you didn't start Twitch, and no, wish, you wish you did. Huh? Oh, god, I got some stories about that that I <laughs> bad, bad decisions I made, but uh, I worked in the business and, and we were just computer nerds growing up, and so you know, I got super into to saltwater fishing when I was about, I don't know, 18 or 20. And there was, after that, there was a few forums around, you know, and that was the only place I could find guys that were as crazy about fishing as I was. I couldn't get friends to go with me. You right. know, I had a boat and I couldn't even find guys to go. My normal buddies want to go once a year. You know, I want to go three times a week, four times a week. <laughs> right. And it's just, it's hard. Yeah. And so um, we were on these other forums and we got to know a bunch of guys, we had a great community of local fishermen, you know, I'd say from LA down and you guys those are just sharing information, just sharing information. Yep. And then those, those, there was two sites and they both had kind of uh, quirky owners to put it politely. Mm -hmm. And the one of them, one guy booted us all off for saying something he didn't like. <laughs> and then the other guy had a local business and had effed up a few people's boats. Okay. And we put it out there. We'd, I mean, friends of mine had helped the guy build his website and all that. And he didn't like that at all. So he tried to sue us and ban us and do all that stuff. And my partner, Jason just, he came up, he's like, dude, let's do our own. And honestly, for the first three, four months, I wasn't even in the picture. He right. started it up. Um, he's a lot more of a tech nerd than me, like doing the computer server stuff and all that. Mm -hmm. So he configured a forum, got it going. And then I couldn't figure out where everybody went from the local groups and all these guys we knew. And, uh, and you remember, this is like before text messaging. Give us, right. a, give us a time. Like uh, 2003. 2003. 2003. Yeah. I mean, okay. literally, I don't think, no, I know Jason didn't have an iPhone back then. Like, no, no. It, this came out was in 2007. Yeah, like you I, called, iPhone came out. That's fucking crazy. It is. No. 2007. You still like called people at their house. Yeah. I mean, you had a cell phone, fuck? but like, if you couldn't get you on the cell. Landline. What the hell? <laughs> yeah. like, that seems like a hundred years ago. <laughs> How so, do you meet somebody? Yeah, I'll just meet you. That there. was just you it. Better like, you, be if you didn't bump into somebody on the dock or at the launch ramp, you were never going to find, you know, anybody else who liked to fish like you. So after we got booted off there, Jason started BD and then he came up with the name, which was brilliant. Right. It was, it's the best name to attract hardcore fishermen. Coincidentally, the worst name to try to sell advertising to the fishing industry. <laughs> <laughs> that story changes a little bit later down the road. I would love to hear that know? story. And the, well, and at that time, conservation was a real huge push. And I think it was sort of on the front end. I think now there's a lot more like assumed conservation, mm -hmm. you know, especially I, I think the attitude towards hunters and fishermen with, with the internet and Instagram and all that people finally realize, dude, we're the ones watching the resource, dude. You Big know what time. I mean? I went to Africa, killed a bunch of shit, right? right? Awesome. Had a great time. I got people jumping my ass like, oh, you're just going over there to murder this and you're killing this wildlife. I'm like, dude, what the fuck have you done yeah. to help that economy? Mm -hmm. Like the money that I paid, and this was during a drought I went there, <clears throat> paid to feed these animals. But right. you're going to sit on your couch in San Francisco and tell me that I shouldn't go over there and hunt? Mm -hmm. I'm pumping money into their economy. I'm a responsible hunter and fisherman. People, I, I think that that has evolved a long way. Sure. You know, and, and once we kind of got accepted in the fishing industry, maybe five or six years in, they didn't. we were the ugly secret, man. Everybody read Bloody Decks every day, but didn't want to talk about it. Right. I'd call advertisers. Dude, they treat me like I was a leper. What kept you, you guys know? going? That's love a long, that's a long we weren't trying to make time. money yeah. so we we got into this and i tell people this about passion businesses all the time we just did it we weren't trying to make money i mean mm. we just want a place where we could talk about fishing share where the fish were at because out here we fish a box that's 100 miles out by 100 miles down so you make a left turn you could burn you know go an extra 100 miles that you didn't need to do 50 miles out of your way 50 back F fuels five bucks a gallon mm -hmm. my boat gets one mile per i mean you can make a 500 hundred dollar mistake in a blink right you know and so we were just there for all the right reasons. Just passion. Oh, we wanted to be able to cuss. That was very important. To us. <laughs> you wanted to be authentic. You just want freedom of speech and, and fishermen like to talk like fishermen and, you know, hunters are the same way. And there was not a place for us to do that. And I found it about, I found the website, I don't know, a month or two later and I got in there. And at the time I had owned a business where I was doing screen printing, embroidery and um, vehicle wraps and all that stuff. I went from the video game business to, I started my own marketing company cause I had a great marketing background mm -hmm. and learned from the best. I worked at Activision, you know, during mm -hmm. the Tony Hawk days. Yeah. And I learned there's a lot of smart people that I picked stuff up from and, uh, sort of applied that to BD, you know, and I started printing stickers and shirts. And I mean, literally on Saturdays we'd be at the launch ramp and we'd have our trucks full 
So you, that stuff. you guys weren't working. What was the relationship? Uh, we just were we friends. Just friends. I was just buddies, buddies that had a project we were right. doing. Everybody was super into it. So that was cool, mm -hmm. you know, and we just did it for fun. And then, um, we, we got a couple years in and we did the day of the Docs show. And over those couple years, like it was rampant. I, we couldn't print shirts fast enough and mm -hmm. we had no real way to distribute them and stickers. So it was like a friend of a friend or a buddy would come over and pick up, you know, a dozen shirts. He'd give us whatever we paid for, you know, 120 bucks for the load. And then he'd go distribute them for us. <laughs> and we had this network. I mean, we had every really good fisherman on this coast and we were all able to learn from each other. Mm -hmm. We were all able to share the older guys kind of got involved and got on the site and like taught us young guys, you know, a little bit more about the history and, you know, ways that we used to catch fish and all that kind of stuff. And then the albacore came back and that just blew the fishing industry wide open. Albacore tuna is like jet fuel for our fishing industry. Everybody can catch them. I mean, my buddy says it the right way that you don't catch them. They catch you. If you can put four <laughs> lures behind your boat, then manage to get hooks on them. You're going to catch them out. Right. Right. So uh, as with so many things, I think timing yeah. played such a huge part. When, was, when was that? When did the Albuquerque? Uh, I want to say like six, oh six or something 06. like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Somewhere in there. Oh six, oh seven. It's all a blur and I have no memory <laughs> at all. And we haven't seen them since. Really? since yeah. yeah. We caught some, I, we were talking about this the other day. I heard of, there's a little spot of albacore. I think it was in 2011 or 12. And we went over, we finished all of our yellowfin early in the morning, way down South. We went and hit this spot. I'm like, put the lures in within two minutes, just really? every lure went off and they're all 40 to 50 pounders. Jesus. I mean, that was a great note to go out on because I haven't seen one in eight years. Yeah. <laughs> you know what That's I mean? That's what happens. I mean, you, you hear about them down South and all of a sudden they're in Washington. You're yeah. like, what the fuck just happened? Well, uh, I've seen maps that show how they migrate and mm -hmm. basically they come into Guadalupe. That's like the bottom of their migration. And then they just come in a hundred miles higher okay. and then a hundred. And so they're just doing their loop. It's a smaller loop up there, yeah. you know, off Oregon and Washington, and you can have those things. I mean, the yellowfin, bluefin, the fishing that we've had in the last five years. It's incredible. It's revitalized the industry again. I mean, dude, during that 08, 09, 2010 period, sport boats were going out of business. I mean, the yep. fishing was terrible. That was when the, the fuel was terrible. The economy was terrible, yeah. and fuel had gone through the roof. Mm -hmm. I mean, our business had got just leveled. You know, and that stuff trickles all the way up to the Walmart level. Walmart right. cut their fishing department down by like 70%. Right. So now guys like pure fishing, which is pen and Bert, they got nowhere to sell their wares. It just, it hurts everybody top to bottom, you know, but then fast forward a few years and man, we're right back on track and we had an El Nino and all kinds of cool stuff. So what were you doing for income when you were, when you were just, you when know, we were building BD, this, yeah. Jason was doing construction okay. and I was, I had my marketing business. Okay. So I was cranking out t-shirts and, you know, I had like 14 guys over in Lakeside um, I had an embroidery machine and we did vehicle graphics and all that. And then, and this is a good part of the story. Oh, eight, Oh nine hit. I think at Oh eight, my business was down, um, 40%. Damn. My main clients were automotive. Like I did all the trucking magazines. Mm -hmm. I did pro comp suspension here mm -hmm. in town, four wheel parts, that shit. They're gone. Vaporized. Yep. I mean, it went from your, my number one account to zero almost. And at the same time, we were doing all of our buddies, which I know all your buddies going out in East County, you too, they're all contractors, right? Yeah. right? Everybody I know is a contractor. So that business, phew, gone. And we did a ton of real estate, gone. Right. And then the fall, we were down 40%. And then the next year we were down like 25%. That makes it difficult to run a business. Yeah. And I was stupid. Uh, that was, this is one of my biggest life lessons. If you sink the ship, there's no boat for everybody to ride on. You have got to make the, like I had the best crew I'd had. I did that for probably 10 years, best crew I'd ever had. And I was doing everything I could to keep them all employed. Mm -hmm. Looking back on it, lay them off. Right, it, yep. It's a harsh reality, you know, hopefully never have to do it. But if I'd have laid those guys off, I would have just brokered my t-shirt printing and sent it out to some of the bigger shops that were better staffed to do it. I'd still be there today mm -hmm. and I probably wouldn't be here today. Right. So it's just one of those lessons in life, you know, when it comes to running a small business that. It's just a reality and you've got to be able to take a step back and look at your business objectively. And at that point in time, I couldn't, I totally, yeah. totally failed. And that's, I think that's a big thing is just, you know, you have to be able to do that and then not lie to yourself. You know, Agreed. That's, that's such a hard thing to do nowadays. People don't want to take a step back and really hear what other people have to say and look. And then it's like, man, I really have to make a change. Yep. Either, either I make the change or we're going to go under and, yep. and you know, it's just a harsh reality, like you said, but you know, it's, it's good that. I guess you're here now, right? And, and, and you're, you're doing your thing. It all happens for a reason. Fortunately for me, like uh, in 09, I had not fortunately, but in 09. So I had my business pretty much roll down to nothing. I mean, mm. we were doing almost a couple million bucks and we were doing a fraction of that when that happened. And in 09, I had like half my family died. 
So oh. now I've got anxiety. I haven't slept. I mean, mm. I was, dude, I was a mess. And I'm a strong person, but like at mm-hmm. some point, you're like, dude, I just can't. Right. You know what I mean? There's nothing left in the tank. I had like in, uh, in January, my aunt died, my great aunt. Then at the end of January, my mom dropped dead at unexpectedly oh. 57 years old, never made it to the bottom of the stairs. And then, uh, like three months later, my grandmother died. And two months later, my grandpa died. Jesus. And I'm going literally tr- staving off bill collectors and phone calls and all this is happening and all that. And it's like, you never want stuff like that to happen to you. Mm-hmm. But at the end, dude, that shit does not, you cannot rattle me. Like my employees, <laughs> they think I'm crazy. Like they'll come in screaming. Everything's on fire. I'm like, well, back no. up. Anybody die? Mm-hmm. No. Anybody have cancer? No. Fuck it. We can work through this. Right. There is just, dude, I'm. I'm unrattleable at this point. I've seen a lot of, you know, stress and anxiety. I'm not going to let that stuff control me anymore. It's just make the best decision you can with the info you can. Well, that's good. And keep man. pushing forward. That's good. That's, and that's a hard lesson to, to learn. It is. And it's just the process of life. And it's, it's just going through it. Totally. You can't read it in a textbook and say, okay, well, that's what I'm going to do when that happens. No, you, you actually have to go through it because you have to feel it. I, I totally agree. I've got a very successful friend who's a lawyer up in LA. And I mean, he's like a bankruptcy attorney and he's lawyered all these stars and, you know, hanging out with all these guys and he told me when i was like at the bottom that man every entrepreneur fails at least once most fail multiple times and you would not believe how many entrepreneurs that i have done their bankruptcy cases yeah and it was like man i'm not alone you know Mm -hmm. so everybody who's tried to do this is eating shit the only thing you could do is learn from it you know and just be a little smarter and the the thing that i did learn as well is Sometimes working harder isn't smarter. Mm -hmm. When that ship was sinking, man, dude, I was in there seven days a week, 16 hours a day. What was I thinking? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I should have worked smarter and should have really taken a step back. But sometimes when you're there in the trenches and and stuff's blowing up around you, you can't. Did you you have any time to fish? Uh, back then I did not have much, yeah. <laughs> you know, so were you still, doing it was tough. Dogs? We were still doing it, man. Yeah. We were still, and like the good thing about owning my own business, we were able to like the way that we built bloody deck starting off with was just t-shirts and swag mm-hmm. and those little stick, those little free white stickers. I mean, we give out 40,000 of those a year. Wow. <laughs> you know, That's like as, it's crazy. And we send them all over the country, all over the world. You got a tournament. I will send you a huge bag of stickers, a bunch of koozies and some free crap. Right. And so the owning my own business allowed me to still go to the Fred hall show Mm -hmm. like we've been going since i think oh six or something that's how you know you're old you go to your first (laughs) one these guys like oh this is my 15th my man you're a loser (laughs) turn around next thing you know you're you're bald a little fatter and yeah Yeah. you've been here for 20 years now congrats so it's like back in my day exactly yeah it's funny man there's something about turning 40 you turn into the old guys or something Uh but no it was it it was a very uh, opportunistic time for me because I was able to still support my passion thing. We didn't, you know, starting off, I'd even say for the first five years, people like, Oh, this is going to be huge. I'm like, yeah, whatever, man, this is not going to turn into a job. Mm -hmm. And then we had an aha moment, which was uh, like, I think our second year we went to the Fred or a day at the docks. It's a little one day show. They do down in the parking lots, you know, down there by Point Loma seafood. And uh, we sold like $4,000 worth of t-shirts and hats in a day. I'm like That's fucking crazy. I know. I told my partner, I'm like, there might be something here. Sure. You know? And we kind of looked at each other and Jason's always kind of trusted me on the business side. And, and I'm like, man, we might want to just see how big we can make this. Cause at, at one point we were like, Oh, there's too many assholes in here. Let's shut the doors right. mm-hmm. and just make it our little fishing club. Mm-hmm. And fortunately we didn't, you know, and we, we had a little bit bigger vision of it. And, uh, that was like, that was really the tipping point in the first couple of years we did the Fred Hall show. I mean, it was crazy, man. You're selling ten dollar t shirts and you're doing thirty grand in three or four days of shirts and hats and people just want to buy your crap. Like that is the <laughs> ultimate insane. loyalty to yeah, me. Right, you know, sure. and we love those guys. Every single one of them. Like they're making it you know, they're making it possible sure. for us not to have to get real jobs, mm-hmm. you know. My other biggest fear in life, getting a real job. Like <laughs> I'm sure you guys can can understand that, right? Absolutely. Having a boss and that kind of stuff. Yeah, that'd be a, be a different uh, avenue. Definitely not something I'm I'm interested in at all. Myself <clears throat> as well. But so you're doing you're doing that. And how does this local knowledge TV show come up? Um, that's another funny story. We didn't. Uh, nobody ever set out to be on TV. My guys came to me like two or three different times and wanted to do a show. And I was like, nope, nope. The money, the layout. Um, it's really intimidating because now like you're doing these ad deals at such and such thousand dollars a month. And then you want to ask for TV money. That's like five times that, Yeah. you know, and not knowing that business and all that, it was scary, but we had sort of a weird thing happen where 
we, uh, my Florida guy. So I've got, I've got some of my employees are in Florida, mm -hmm. my artist, my editor and a video guy. And, um, it started out, I just had the artist and the editor over there and we had all had a good mutual friend. His name was Jose Wahebe. And he had probably the longest running, most successful fishing show is called the Spanish fly. I mean, he goes all the way back to being on ESPN, Jesus. you know, 20 years ago, Jose was the man in the industry. Everybody loved him. Awesome dude. I mean, you just can't say enough great things about Jose. Well, Jose liked to fly airplanes and Jose was a little reckless and he got into a freaking plane crash and he dirt darted oh. in oh, the Everglades man. basically and died. And that was, I want to say, I think it was five years ago this year. Um, Jose had a right hand man named Mikey and Mikey just did all of his editing and did all that stuff for him. And we got to be friends with Mikey over the years, but I'd never met him. Well, after Jose died, um, we were in the process of doing a project for the state of Louisiana. They want you to come fish there. Mm -hmm. So they hired Bloody Decks basically to build this website to educate you all about the fishing in Louisiana and what species and techniques. And I mean, it was this That's crazy, rad. huge product we, project we did over and a couple of years. Reverse Funnel, they found you? They found us. Because we had of a, the internet? <clears throat> because of your website? They were actually, they were going out and kind of uh, getting themselves familiar with the fishing industry. Mm -hmm. And they had had one of their employees was out there basically acting as a face of the department to the industry. And we got to be friends with them. Young guy likes to fish and we are still great friends to this day. So he kind of got us in, in there to bid on the project and Jose was going to do the video component. And while all this was happening, <coughs> Jose passed away. Oh my so gosh. Mikey was like, Hey, you know, I think I can handle this. Let's, um, you know, let's get, let's get together and see what we can do. And I, I basically told Mikey, you know, he didn't know how to sell. He didn't know how to even package anything up. He was just, he was really good at video and you can see the potential. And, uh, I told him like, look, dude, let me handle the business side of things. I, you're like, they've all, you've got this number X guaranteed, however much money it was, I will get you at least X. Right. And if I can sell it for more, you'll get X plus. And sure as shit, I basically sold it for double the number that they had in mind. Rad. He made extra money. Um, in the meantime, he'd done a couple of little projects for us. We saw the kid was super, super talented. I mean, he's like at that time, I think 24, 25. And, uh, and so he, we, we kind of grew some trust there. And then after that project was over, we brought him on board with us to do video work for our partners. And then him and our creative guy, Derek, just bugged me, you know, hey, we got to do this, we got to do this. <laughs> Finally, I'm like, okay, we had a couple of sponsors we thought we could rely on. I'm like, let's give it a shot. And, uh, and, and like I talk about all the time, it had to be fun. Like the minute right. it's not fun, man, I'm out. And it, it's been a lot of fun. I'm so lucky to get to so do when, it. So when did the actual show come about because it went like, from bloody like when did local how did local knowledge come to be it, it, so that's that kind of, all yeah. yeah that was all in that same time frame about four or five years ago mm -hmm. um we put together a pilot and we shot a, to, we just, in order to pitch in order to pitch it okay. yeah so right I, I went down there a fish with rush for a little bit and, and then, how'd you meet rush uh rush and rush was like jose's pro prodigy okay and so rush and mikey my video guy and jose mikey worked out of jose's house every single day and rush was like uh was basically jose's prodigy he'd candle get the boat ready had the boat, the Jose wasn't fishing like a guide anymore. So Rush would tell him where to go fish right. and all that. And we just all kind of got to be friends and Rush is a great dude. And so like, it, it just all came together pretty naturally. And the thing that we kind of identified early on was in all the years of watching fishing shows, I know you've watched them since you were a kid. There's never been a bi-coastal show. Right. So now for marketers and stuff, you're not mm -hmm. just touching the Florida market, which is really saturated as far as like reach from those guys. They really focus on that. But now you're touching East coast and West coast and you're traveling you know, mm -hmm. and a lot of what we do on our show, I mean, there's just no way to, to take it away. It was influenced by what Jose did. Jose was never a pitch man at all. The guy was just really laid back, really smooth, never took himself too seriously, you know, and just laid the products out like you're saying, you know, get the product out there doing what mm -hmm. it should be do doing in the environment that it is. And that was my big pitch was like, look, no tackle company can afford to do shoots in five different states and three different countries every year. But if we take tackle company money and boat company money and outboard money and sunglass money and you pull those all together, now all of your partners are getting the benefit of, you know, seeing a guy casting up against a rock wall way down in Baja right. or, you know, being in Guatemala fishing and drinking out of a Yeti cup. I mean, it really, by pulling all those guys together, it's just, it really made sense for the businesses. And our big thing, like I was saying, is those deliverables, you know, guys like Yeti pay huge, huge dollars to get a picture of a guy holding up a yellowtail in front of a Yeti cooler. Sure. You know, you go through an agency, God knows what that's going to cost oh, you. Well, forget now, about it. Fuck that. And we've got the young hungry team who's delivering Absolutely. that stuff as part of a sponsorship, you know, and in times when things get lean and guys are getting cut, guess who doesn't get cut? The guys that are providing actual well, I mean, value. you're providing content to tourism industries that help market that local fishing, yep. which is something that they want to do. I mean, the city of San Diego, we just had $19 million we spent on this national campaign. 
I don't I have I've only seen the commercial, but I'm guessing it's a national rollout. Yeah. And I'm guessing that it's not on social, it's not on digital, it's not broken up. You know, so yes, they spent a lot of money when they could have spent a quarter of that money with you. And that's a big part of what we do. Like if we're going somewhere new, first person we reach out to is a tourism board. Absolutely. And a lot of times just for asking, they'll pay for airfare and put you up. Mm-hmm. You know yeah. what I mean? Because you know, they know they you're bringing value. Too. And then we show them what we did for the last guys, send them a, a Dropbox with all these images and we cut little videos like Instagram pieces and all that. Yep. Anybody who's a marketer knows, especially on the product marketing side, like you need content. You need something to talk about every day. And that's mm-hmm. a big part of my pitch. Like I just get, look, we're going to give you tons of shit you can talk about. Every single you day. You make it stupid proof. And you could, yeah, you just send make them it, everything that exactly. they need to have. Exactly. Whoever the team is, whoever the upper management is, here it is. You want stats? I can have analytics behind it. Yep. And yep. we haven't lost a sponsor yet. Yeah. We just continue to add really? to them. Yeah, no, that's, that's right. big. No, that's huge. We're, dude, we're super lucky, but it's relationships, man, especially in our now, are business. Are they sponsoring the show? Yes. Well, yeah. well, we got, I mean, my ultimate goal is have everybody sponsor BD and the show. Yeah. And so I do digital deals. Yep. And then we also do. Um, the TV deals mm-hmm. and they just work hand in hand. So like uh, Bubba Blade, I'm sure you've heard of them. Maybe you yeah. have. It's an out, it's a here. sportsman's knife. Okay. <clears throat> well, they just did a big rebrand. The original owner sold the business, and you know they come in and they're like, "Hey, we're doing a rebrand. We want to do this, this, and that." We hadn't had them as an advertiser in a while. The the founder was a little kooky, and we kind of got away from that. Mm-hmm. And these new guys, basically the parent company of Smith and Wesson, now owns them. Really? I, we go in there with a solution across every platform. Sure. You know, mm-hmm. you want digital marketing? We've got that. You want yeah. inbox marketing? We have an email list. You want social media support we've got a big social media audience you want to be on tv we've got that oh you want a brand film that's another thing that we are super passionate about is we do brand films for some of these guys where we will identify a topic that really works well with what they're trying to do we just did one for grundens it was a huge hit and you know they make the slickers and the boots and all that the bait barge guys right slam dunk Uh yeah They live in Grundens. They live in the boots and all that. So we, using all these relationships and places we've been and all that, kind of identify a story. We go and pitch it to these guys. They green light it. And now we get to make a little film, which is honestly what we really like doing. Putting Mm -hmm. out 30 minutes of TV is awesome. It's a blast. But like getting to tell a little story in a little time frame and really stylize it and make it look cool, that's what gets us. We already have all the whole production team there. It's already there. I mean, but you guys, you get that. You understand that on a level that most people, I mean, they just don't get what's totally. going on. And they're paying, used to paying, the bigger guys used to pay an agency yep. and you're never mm-hmm. going to get the quality and you're going to pay five times what we're charging for that stuff. I mean, you're going to give those sponsors so much more value because of that engagement. And I think coming from the internet side, we are always like, uh, we're the girlfriend that wants to make you happy. Yeah. Print guys, fat lazy been doing it for a million years and I, I mean that figuratively but like dude all they've been doing is rolling out of bed and like oh may i take your order for mm-hmm. advertising right. fuck that we had to claw dude nobody even wanted us to make it in this business mm-hmm. because we were saying bad words and letting fishermen act like fishermen right. and they thought that wasn't what the industry was i think prior to social media our business everybody really thought it was grandpa and little bobby going down to the lake holding hands <laughs> You know, grandpa doesn't drive a diesel freaking which pickup. Is, which is fucking crazy. It is. No matter what coast you live on, if you go by any marina, it's fucking full with boats. They didn't want to hear that. It's fucking crazy. And and our guy here is one of our contractor buddies we all went to high school with who makes like 250 grand a year, drives a badass diesel truck, and he tows a $200,000 Parker behind it. Mm-hmm. Right? That is our business. Yeah. If you think it's anything but that, you're a fool. Yeah. You know? And so I think that that really... I think that the the social media aspect really opened people's eyes up to that. And, you know, when Facebook came along, we were like, oh, shit, BD's dead. People are just going to create a, their own group or whatever, and, and Facebook's going to take over. And it definitely had an impact in our business, I think, especially initially. But after a while, you kind of realize that uh, the Internet has become a set of micro niches, yep. right? You're not a car Subcultures. fan. Subcultures, yep. You're not a Toyota fan. You're a Toyota, you know, Skyline fan. <laughs> Right. Mm-hmm. From 1982 to 1987. That's the one that yes. you're into. And those are the guys you want to talk to. Right. right. So as things became more niche, I think that we, we weathered basically the initial storm of saying, Oh shit, let's pack it in. Facebook just killed us. And being like, Hey, why don't we get a big Facebook presence? And mm-hmm. you've got 150,000 people follow us on Unbelievable. Facebook. Right. And, so impressive. 150,000 people. Yeah. Dude, insane. It should be more. It really should. I feel like, well, but I think every business owner, but I mean, it's like, you, you, <laughs> know you know feel like that for every platform. For every, you feel, I mean, right. no, you, you're you totally feel right. like your, you know, your YouTube views should be more, which you have over a million YouTube views, except when you go to your website, you're putting them on, on Vimeo. Yeah, well, right. we do. No, though, I, we switched to YouTube because oh, you Vimeo switch to YouTube. wouldn't. Yeah, because 
I mean, a lot of people but don't you, know but this. You, but you did it. You did it. You made a conscious decision, no just question. like you said before, no because question. you wanted the user experience to be the best. And because so if YouTube wasn't good at that time. YouTube you searches. Said, yeah. YouTube so is the go. second biggest search engine in the world. And a lot of people don't realize Unbelievable. that. You know what I mean? You think well, of YouTube as being a you video place, you know, and, and that's a big part of it is Huge. optimizing it. Do we, we're getting no love for the show on YouTube. There's a million backyard guys holding their cell phone up, screaming into it, catching a bass. <laughs> I'm not even joking. That'll do a million views like in a week. Right. And we're like, what the fuck? We're right. putting out Lamborghini content yeah. here right. and we're not getting anywhere. And it turns out that it's like a lot of how you tag stuff and how you organize it and yep. all that. Jason, th that's where Jason shines. Mm -hmm. Jason is not the guy you send into a sales meeting, but that <laughs> dude, if I give him like homework, like, hey, go beat YouTube, yeah. he puts on his geek hat and he digs in there. So he relabeled everything. He code worded yep. everything. Coded. And we were getting like one YouTube comment a week. Now we get like 10 a day. You get like, you have like so, the last post, you had like 53 comments. Not only did you have 53 comments, but you had responses on top of responses to all of those comments. For sure. And we try to engage like those personalized, guys. Personalized, personalized. I, dude, I, that, I get on there really cool. every, and that was a big thing Jose did. He was just very personal with the social media. Mm -hmm. We try to do the same thing. Like it's, it cracks me up. Like you meet guys. Oh, you're so down to earth. I'm like, dude, I'm just a nerd that likes to fish <laughs> who got lucky. You know, <laughs> like what I'm a, I'm as into this as you are kind of yeah. thing, you know? It's, it's so funny. And I think a big part of that is just being genuine mm -hmm. with the guys that are watching and, you know, you meet somebody at a boat show, actually take the time to learn their name and, you know, figure out what, what they're into and all that kind of stuff. Like, dude, I am the luckiest guy on earth. Me and my brother used to lay on our stomachs in El Cajon in our shitty little house over there at Mollison and Bradley. And we would watch fishing shows and dream about being that guy, right? Mm -hmm. you know, just dream about being able to travel around and catch all these fish and get all these free Even rods and reels and all that Australia, the that's, Great what Reef that's what i'm saying it's like, like unbelievable man. dude you can't like this you can't knock the smile off my yeah. face i'm so so lucky you know i saw one of those stupid effing instagram memes the other day and it was like instead of saying if i and i do i throw those things out i can't even stand looking at them normally but it's like instead of saying i have to go to work say i get to go to work right and i mean it, it was just like one of those things right yeah that's probably true especially if you've got a really good job you yeah. know and my partner jason he's really sick right now he's waiting on a kidney transplant oh no oh, no that'll put your world in perspective for sure you know he's freaking three years younger than me or two years on me so he's 42 and he's waiting on a kid and he's on dialysis every other day. And I mean, sick as a freaking dog. It brings on all this other stuff that you don't hear about. And all he wants to do is get back to work, right. you know, and go fishing. He hasn't been on a boat in a year and a half. And I guarantee you, he's got a new perspective on, you know, what's important and, and what you're working for and all that. It's just uh, all those things kind of help you, I think, put things into perspective. Absolutely. So does this segue into hunting? Are you guys going to be able to do anything that way? Or are you guys just really being hyper-focused on fishing? Well, we, as you know, I love to hunt. And right. Jason does too. Right. Duck hunting and all that. And I got bitten by the bow hunt bug. And that's like, Dude. it's all I want to do. It's <laughs> right. all... What's that? For bow, somebody ignorant like me. Bow hunting is uh, shooting an animal, a big game animal with a bow and arrow versus a rifle. Yeah. Okay. With a rifle, you're typically going to kill an animal or make your shot at 150 to 200 yards. With my bow, it's like 20, 25 yards. Do you take a bow in yeah. Alaska? Yeah. Yes. So we have to, it's a, it's a stocking type of, of hunting instead of more of a, I mean, you can't do it in a stand in, in the Midwest. They'll sit up in stands, but in Alaska, what we do is we, we stock and you know, you have to get up on, on your little perch and, and, and figure out where you're at. But my, my goal was last year to, uh, you know, harvest a moose with, with a, a bow, um, I was tracking something and it ended up being a grizzly bear. So uh, I turned around and, kinda, <laughs> and ran. Yeah. Screaming was, like a girl through the woods. Exactly. Yeah, no, we've all been there. <laughs> I, I literally got back to my tent and I was like, my hands were just like shaking. Even if I would have had to draw on that thing, it, it was, it was a pretty, pretty gnarly experience. Um, but it, it is one of the most rewarding hunts you'll ever do. Is no question. And you're so much more in tune with what's, it's like fly fishing versus regular fishing. Like fly fishing is not my bag. I'm a savage meat lure, big fish fisherman. I'm totally fine with that. But on the bow hunting side, like if you go to shoot a deer with a rifle at 250 yards, it doesn't even know you're there. Like has no chance. You're just basically shooting something. It's like, and I'm not taking away from it. If that's your bag. I'm totally with it. I get mm -hmm. it. There's a lot of other elements to hunting besides actually pulling the trigger, finding the animal, you know, getting your tag, making it out there, glassing and all that stuff. But man, when you go to bow hunting, now that deer or elk or whatever is at 20, 25 yards, you've got to be so freaking sneaky or even the, 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 really the pinnacle is the spot and stock. Like he's talking about where you take an animal that's been evolved over a million years, literally 
to be scared as shit of anything that comes near it. And mm -hmm. you being a fat guy in camouflage can go into his backyard, however many miles, five, 10. Yeah. I mean, we do 15 mile days on our boots all the time. Mm -hmm. Sneak up on that guy. Then when the time comes, be able to stand up with your ass puckered shut and be able to draw your bow back <laughs> and slip an arrow through his vitals. Like with bow hunting, if you miss by three inches, you're Fucked. done. Yeah. Yeah. You're done. You're going to be chasing a bleeding animal for God knows how long and probably not recover it. That whole thing is like, it's, it, it is, it's the pinnacle, you know, for me of hunting and you don't even get that rush in fishing. It's very, intimate. you know, it is, it's so intimate and they're so it, it's intimate and there's just so much time that evolves. I guess when you see the deer coming, I see a deer coming. I know he's coming. If I'm going to stand from 150 yards away, my knees start knocking immediately, <laughs> Yeah, you know? And I, like I went to Africa and I, I had this great trip. I shot a bunch of stuff I'd only dreamed about. And I came home and I went to my buddy's place in South Dakota and there's, I'm, we're going to take a dough to put in the freezer. This dough comes up behind me. I turn around, I go to draw. I'm home for like a month from Africa and my knees are shaking. I'm like, this is a freaking stupid dough mm -hmm. that I'm just going to shoot to put in the freezer. I'm like, that's how you know this is something for me. Yeah. Get you that fired up. And with fishing, like the last five seconds of catching a big fish, you're re I really get anxious and I really get fired up. And I like to take that opportunity to slow everything down to make sure you don't screw up. Mm -hmm. And literally in my head the whole time, like, I'm like, don't fuck up, don't fuck up, don't fuck up. Th that's going through my head the whole time. Don't run the fish over, you know, don't position the boat wrong, don't do whatever. And then once it's dead, it's dead. I think the bow hunting just is that, it's that to the next level. I get a little bit of that with this bluefin. Um, that's the one I'm talking about. Yeah. Especially. We yeah. just, um, in San Diego, just a few years ago, we, we started coming up with some big bluefin. Yep. And uh, man, hunting those, you know, fish and going after them. I've never caught a bluefin that big. I mean, we, we would get in the sixties, you know, of, yep. God, how long ago was that? Like five or six years ago. And that was like a big, big, big deal, fish. big yep. deal. Yep. And, um, when these ones started coming up, you heard the hundred, 120. Yeah. Then you're like, Holy shit. Someone just caught a two Oh four. Yep. And then it's a two fifty, and now they're getting close to three. So they went over 300 now. Oh yeah. Three yeah. mid threes, or mid threes out yeah. here off the coast in our backyard. And going after those is, you know, it's a, for me, cause I don't get to get out as often. <clears throat> you're taking a lot of day, a lot of, a lot of resources to go out there and you're, you might swing and miss. Totally. But just making sure that you are on point. Like you said, every little thing matters. And if you can just take that, you know, attitude and, and do it, it is very, very rewarding to grab one of those. It's so like, if you're not a fisherman and it's so hard to understand, but like I fished here, saltwater very hardcore for 25 years. My biggest tuna in, I mean, thousands of tunas that have either come across my boat or I've caught was 60 pounds, yeah. you know, a bluefin, like 62 pound bluefin. And that was awesome. Super stoked. Well, all of a sudden El Nino happens, right? And now we're catching fish that never existed in our waters ever. Mm. This was four years ago, like Wahoo. Yeah. Right. I never in my lifetime thought I would see a Wahoo in California waters. We put 14 on our own boat. We got one off the nine mile bank. Oh, dude, we got, I got them on the rock pile, like traditional <laughs> inshore spots where the water's cold and green. It blew up beautifully. And we were catching Wahoo. We swam with the whale shark. Yeah. I mean, there was wow. only two whale sharks that I know of during the El Nino that anybody saw. We saw one of them. And with the same day, we had giant manta rays, like the 12 footers doing flips. I mean, did you get video? Just, uh, we got total footage, yeah. underwater oh, footage right. of it and all that. Yeah. Like we and got to do so we're, much crazy we're stuff. We're going to put all the links in the show notes. We use that stuff. Usually put up on the, on the site really the quick site. and then yeah. social and all that, you know, wherever you because get it out kind of quick mean, and dirty. You have to distribute the information. I mean, you become a media company. Fish, so fish reports. As much as you want to personally get out there, you got, you have a team. Oh that no, that's. How do we get this information to our members? And that's how you like personally that. justify taking off on a Tuesday. <laughs> right? I'm not even joking. You're like, I'll just write a fish report. Yeah. It'll be cool. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, no, that, but that is totally part of the game. And then the El Nino gave way. We're like, oh shit, it's gone. Now what are we going to do? We don't even want to live anymore because it's, it was so good. Mm -hmm. And just all this phenomenal stuff that had never been caught here, giant marlin and all that stuff. And then it followed right up with these bluefin. The last time we had bluefin of this size was a hundred years ago in our local waters. Literally nobody was alive to see it the last time yeah. from like 1908 to like 1918, 1920, depending hmm. on who you talk to these same fish, whatever concurrence and atmospheric conditions set up came into our waters a hundred years ago. And now wow. 
we're in the middle of it, you know? And a lot of the guys that I talk to all the time and look up to are these older captains that I read about when I was a kid and all that. And where did you read about? Now them? they're my Western outdoor news, the, yeah. the green monster, man. Yeah. I think would show yep. up every Thursday in my mailbox. <laughs> there you go. I read it. Like, I mean, I was standing there waiting for it as a kid. Uh, and now these guys that I read about are all my buddies. It's the craziest, most surreal, surreal thing ever, you know? And what's the magazine doing now? Uh, have they, have not, not much. Not much. <laughs> there like was a website that came, yeah, there was a website that came along and yeah. took a lot. Dude, I mean, yeah, if, if you're not digital, you're, you'll, you'll be extinct. Well, and Derek will tell you this. I used to read what happened at the it's Coronado crazy. Islands two weeks ago. Newspaper. If I, if my, if I'm getting information that's two days, two yeah. days yeah. old now, that's old info. Yeah. You know, it's no joke. You were two weeks behind sure. a week and a half by the time that stuff went to press. Yeah. So BD really, you know, and, and it's a bummer cause we grew up with it, but we, if they, if Western outdoor news had started a website, you know, anywhere near the amount of time that we did within our first five years, they would have squashed us. Yeah. Older guys didn't get the internet. Fortunately for us, a little bit younger kind of got the internet and, and, you know, taking what we both knew about the internet, Jason's tech skills, Mm -hmm. and then my marketing, you know, background and all that. It, we just, we, we, we got lucky, Mm -hmm. you know, to put it a lot of hard work when I say lucky a lot. I mean, there's obviously a lot of hard work. What's the guiding philosophy for bloody decks? Uh, I don't know, man. Freedom of speech would probably be a big pillar yeah. for us. And then just like, just being, being ourselves, doing what we love. Like it isn't hard to sell someone advertising when they know that you're living this and you just like, you geek out it's, on it. I mean, it, you the know? website is incredible. I, you know, I, I spent so much time on so many different, I mean, first of all, how many websites do you operate? <laughs> this is better, there's, there's a, a good, good question. Handful. Yeah. And there's some stuff we got. I got, I'm a, I'm like there's a serial multiple entrepreneur. streams of income trying to make, you know, yeah. fishing reports. I and... think I filed like nine tax returns last year. I'm <laughs> not even good. joking. So I got other I stuff it. going on. That's not it. in the fishing business and all that. But it, I think once you kind of get your hands around that, it's not real hard and you see an no, opportunity absolutely. to grow, you know, and but we, it's the value, you know, the reason that you're growing is because you're adding so much value to totally. what people want. No, I, I mean, you were like that kid waiting for that magazine to come, except now you can get it on any form you want, yep. however you want it. And we understand on can, I'm on Instagram. Okay. This is where, you know, and this is the link that can take me to the site and the forum that somebody I care about. I can ask a question. It's going to get answered. Yep. This is the new product. And I think that's what you have to ask yourself when you're trying to sell something, you know, what does my client really need? Mm-hmm. Because a lot of times you're just trying to sell what you have. Yeah. Right. And so along the way we've gotten smarter, we've gotten more refined, we've gotten more sophisticated after about, let's see, we had the forum, just a forum going. I started to notice around 2010. I'm like, man, why are these freaking magazine guys getting all these big checks? I mean, some of those guys are getting 10 grand a month for a single freaking page. Right. I'm over here working my balls off for a thousand dollars a month. Mm-hmm. What the is different, you know? And I'm like, I keep forgetting I can cuss. This is very unusual. <laughs> <laughs> trying to, try to be professional. And so like, I'm like, oh, I know what it is. It's the editorial. These guys can write you a shiny review. These yeah. guys can show your product, you know, being fished in some destination or whatever. I'm like, okay, well, that's our new thing. Yep. We're going to do editorial. And we'll and, do it better. And we'll do it better. And we'll have analytics to back it up. And we'll be able to use 100 photos Because you can distribute 100,000 magazines, but how many people saw your ad on page 57? We do 400,000 unique viewers a month. That's so insane. if you can't find a way to... And, and the biggest magazine at the time was like 125,000 subscribers. You know, if you can't find some way to get yourself into that business as a smart guy, you're doing something wrong. Yep. And so that was a big turning point for us in 2011. I sold a little chunk of the company, like 10%. I raised some capital. Um, and then I applied that capital to hiring an editor and I didn't just go find some dude. We went and hired the editor from Marlin magazine, the mm-hmm. most prestigious magazine, basically in our business. Marlin's the one that I still read. I love it, mm-hmm. you know, and, uh, he helped us build out an edit team. He kind of taught us how the whole editorial side of things worked. He had a bunch of relationships with different, uh, industry people. Like when you're at Marlin magazine, the advertisers come to you yeah. when you're starting out bloody decks, you got to go to them. <laughs> yep. right. So there was a lot of equity. I would say that, that we were able to kind of quickly build there. And then we hired, you know, we found a bunch of local experts, the guys that had written in other places or maybe hadn't written who should have been. And we made them our editors. So we've got a California editor, a Baja editor, you know, and then we have a bunch of freelance Are guys. Part time or full time. They're all, uh, they're all part time. We have our, our editor in chief is in Florida. He's full time. Those guys are. T- I love the 1099, <laughs> especially for guys that are out of the office yeah, in another state. For sure. Oh, dude, we tried to set up payroll in Florida one time for another business. It was a nightmare. Did you try like, running a restaurant in yeah, California? No, no thanks, no thanks. <laughs> or, I, or I know, a butcher shop for that. I know matter. way too much about running restaurants yeah. in California from one of my good buddies, and <laughs> you guys can have that. That's, that's not. That's not for me. So you uh, also did fish dope, <clears throat> which. 
somewhat got controversial, right? With uh, the local fisher fishermen, a lot of these fishermen think that, you know, if they catch fish, that's their spot. They put in the time, they put in the effort. They're not going to share their spots with anybody else. Yep. You took a different approach to it and you guys do, and you guys share the knowledge of where, where things are at for guys like me, I'm a, I'm a subscriber and, and it's uh, I think it's amazing. I mean, it, it's, you know, I know a lot of people give shit for it, but I'm like, fuck dude, if I can't get out there all the time and this is like some information that I'm not getting two weeks later, yep. that's actually happening yesterday. Yep. And here's what happened in Point Loma. Here's what happened in Ocean Beach. Here's what happened at the rock pile the 182 the 181 the 43 like you're you're talking about all the different waters i mean dude that's invaluable it's cliff notes for fishing yeah, it really yeah. is it, you know for a guy who isn't piped in and doesn't know a million people or who's not on the water every day we keep you on on the bite and is it perfect no right. we'll tell you where they were mm-hmm. yesterday We'll tell you where it happened. We'll use our experience to vet that information. Fish swim. They Fish have <laughs> fins and they like to use them. That's right. one of the things that we say all the time. Mm-hmm. But, you know, for an average guy, it really is a great tool. And that's where, you know, we got to a point in our business like 2008 where we're like, man, this is kind of stagnant. We only have the X amount of advertisers. We weren't getting a lot of traction. And one of the things that me and Jason always did before we go fishing is we print out a teraffin map, which was the sea surface temperature chart. So you could see all the currents and you could predict where the fish were going to be that day. And then we would call Derek or call our buddies or whatever. And, oh, you caught this here. We make marks on the map. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now I got kind of a picture of what was going on. Oh, shit. I need a tide. So I cut out a tide chart and I tape it to it. And next thing you knew, I had the rudimentary fish dope map in my hand. Wow. And so there was 976 services that you could use. You'd call in and either have a subscription and you'd listen to a phone recording. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. No shit. Or the guy for extra money would actually talk to you and tell you what he knew. (laughs) I swear to God, this all seems so funny now that you're looking back (laughs) on it, you know? And, uh, and so we all, we, one of us would subscribe to that and the rest of us would poach it because we were broke and you know, that's how things work. And people are doing that to us right now, unfortunately. But, uh, you know, we would, we would use all that info together. And I told Jason, I'm like, dude, we know every fisherman on this coast, mm-hmm. practically got good relationships. Like, why don't we do this kind of on a next level thing? And this is something we've learned in business. If Jason doesn't like the idea, it will be a success. He's like, there's no <laughs> way this will never work. It yeah. totally sucks. And then a few years later, it is seriously like the driving force behind our business. Like really? before we blew up and started doing a lot more ads and stuff, fish mm-hmm. dope, it was, it was a, a time main, and a place main thing. source of income fishing well we started in 09 Mm -hmm. so it was we're like yeah we got like 300 members this is awesome (laughs) Mm -hmm. and the fishing was so bad the economy all the other stuff we talked about and then after a few years and an el nino and all that i mean it's just exploded and to the point where we can we have enough members where we can do stuff we only dreamed of yeah you know we give you a daily report where we call around and we talk to everybody that we know or party boat guys or whatever no it goes on a subscriber page so you basically log into the website okay yeah and then on top of that, we're like, man, what if we could fly a spotter plane? How cool would that be? Mm-hmm. And everybody's talked about that for decades. Well, nobody ever had the cash to do it because they didn't have X amount of subscribers where you could take a little bit from each guy mm-hmm. and afford to fly an airplane. Mm-hmm. So we did it. You know, we well, found the a buddy. business is coming next. Right? It's, it's a frequently asked question. <laughs> we actually, People we, want to get on that spotter plane. Right? That, is, that is one of the uh, tax <laughs> returns that we file. No, no airplane. <laughs> no rights. airplane business. No. Not yet. Um, but I mean, you even do the bait. Oh, yeah, yeah, bait you, reports. I mean, every, bait reports. All the like, info we can who get has you. good bait? You know what? What? How? What the size? Sardines, anchovies. You know, whatever it is. It's like, man, that's. Look, I don't have much time off, and when I have that time, what yep. I want to do is I want to go get the right bait and go out and have fun. You're right, and you're affording them that luxury to go do that. So why not? And it's just helping the whole community. Like people don't understand. They they want to talk shit all the time. It's like, look. He's bringing more money to this whole industry. What the fuck are you, what what are you mad about? And that's like, so we've got guys that are hardcore guys that have stopped talking to us since we did fish dope. And of course they used it early on and they contributed info and then they got too good to, you know, they're, they're so good now or their little network. They don't need it. That other info. Hey, that's cool, man. I'm totally Mm -hmm. fine with it, you know, but for the average guy, we provide a valuable service and I feel like our responsibility in our business, look, fishing is a dying sport. It, there's no other mm-hmm. way to say it in mm-hmm. California, especially yeah. hunting is a dying sport. If you can get somebody stoked on either of those sports, you've done your job, yeah. mm-hmm. you know? And so if the average weekend warrior guy like Derek, who doesn't have a bunch of friends that are hardcore fishermen can go out and catch some fish, dude, we've won. Yeah. We've totally won. And like people are, well, you're selling it out or whatever. You know, it's like, I'm not selling shit out. I'm working my ass off yeah. to get you this information to get more people. I'm over well, here. They making don't have our, to buy it. That's it. Totally. Don't buy it. I'm don't here working to make it. our industry yeah. stronger. 
And you're over here trying to tear it down and tell everybody you should be the only one to catch fish. Man, yeah. that, that ain't the big picture. Right. The big picture is trying to make everybody win. And, you know, for every guy that complains about it, we've got a thousand subscribers that say that, you know, it's, you know, it, it, it's the ultimate thing for them How because they're busy or whatever. Oh, we don't talk about that number. But you, but as far as like members for BD for bloody decks. So for on the, on the website of bloody decks, we have registered members. I think, I don't even know, like 125,000. Unbelievable. It's crazy. That's insane. It's totally like 70,000 email subscribers. I mean, it's our nuts. email list, is like up to 110. 110. Yeah. That's, you might've looked at our old media kit or something, yeah. but no, it's blown up. I was up. digging deep. Well, we've been, yeah, we've been serious. That's been a big, like it's huge. Man, build audience. So over the yeah. last few years, we've come up with ways to build email addresses mm -hmm. and most people if you're giving away a bitching trip to guatemala to go fishing right. they'll give you their email address mm -hmm. and that's one of the things that we've developed over the years with our audience that is irreplaceable and i think it applies to any business is trust yeah your food's never going to be shitty you're gonna have a bad day you know and i hope when you serve somebody a bad plate of food you come out there and use it as an opportunity to make a, a new fan and give them a 30 dollars gift card mm -hmm. and you know you're gonna have a day where who knows you know your guys you're gonna have an employee you got a bad day and yell at somebody and mm -hmm. you're gonna make it right and you have to build that trust social media lets us do that and it lets us do it you know bd is the original social media for fishermen before facebook sure before mm -hmm. instagram fishermen yep. could interact with fishermen that is as social media as you get right. right we've just extended it to other platforms but building that trust those guys know i'm never going to put my logo on a shitty t-shirt that you can see through <laughs> i mean it's simple things like that right well it's it it's crazy because it happens all the time all the time i mean you go to enough events to see i mean all we, the time you know, all the events that we do and we see it's unfucking believable that yep. people would like you're you're diminishing your brand by not caring Dude, I've seen brands, especially in our business, get bastardized overnight mm -hmm. by a guy trying to make an extra three bucks on a product right. or putting out a shitty lure or putting out a reel that's not ready there yet or whatever. And I'm sure it happens in every industry. Or right? different hats. You're like, I'm not going to fucking wear that hat. Dude. Yeah. You just gave me this hat. It cost you seven bucks or whatever it cost you. You gave it to me. It looks like a fucking yarmulke. It's going to sit in my closet. It's going to collect dust. Why not just pay the extra Spend few bucks, eight bucks and fucking have something mm -hmm. that I want to rock? Dude, that's my motto. I like... One of the things I talk about all the time is I don't want to get out of bed every morning and make shitty stuff, right. whatever that is. Right. I do not want to make shitty. I want to make good stuff that I can be proud of and have other people be stoked on. A lot of business owners, I think, need to look at that. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, in the restaurant business, guy's going to serve you a shitty cut of fish because he saved a dollar. Unbelievable. It happens all the fucking time. I, it's due to all the time. nuts. Or how many restaurants have you seen that used to be killer? Like yeah. your favorite restaurant in town and something happens and all of a sudden. Well, they start looking at their food cost and they're like, well, we, we built this amazing business. But if we save two points on our food cost and we start getting shittier produce, guess what? Now the salad sucks. Or they get a Coke problem or they get divorced or they get. I mean, there's just so mm -hmm. many of these things where people will have a trusted brand. It could be as simple as your car wash. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? And like, oh, dude, we don't go there anymore. But I think restaurants really illustrate that. Because, I mean, we've all seen it. There's been restaurants in, in, in East County that sure. have been staples that all of a sudden somebody just kind of checks out. That You, you just can't do that. You got to get up every morning and try to be the best at what you're doing. Yeah. Dude, I appreciate you coming out. It's awesome yeah. to, to hear your story and, and, and to, you know, dig deep into what you're doing and all that stuff. So, I mean, take... For taking the time out, I know you're busy and you're flying back out to Florida to go do the the Miami boat show. Yep. Um, with your brand new boat, um, I'm excited to try that out and see how that thing rides with that Sea Keeper on it. Um, I'm excited to see if I'm going to put one on my boat. But thanks for coming out. Um, I know we do a social shout out, so Sean's mm -hmm. going to yeah. Run so that we one. got um B Sh B Schmidt uh, Northman BBQ. Uh, he's been hashtagging behind the smoke. He is a barbecue fan uh, located in north of. Germany, which is pretty badass, but he's uh, getting into the craft and he's following the podcast. So we are going to be sending a behind the smoke, sexy mug to Germany. Um, so you can have whatever you drink, uh, over there, but dude, this was badass. Really, really, uh, really cool what you're doing to, you know, promote the sport and to I mean, to give back and do doing something that you love. Thanks, man. I really appreciate it. It's been a lot of fun talking yeah, to you guys. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll put all the links in there, uh, Local Knowledge TV, how you can watch the show, how you can follow along. Uh, but thank you guys for listening. We appreciate it. Thanks for having me.